Hello. Welcome to Frontline. I am Obiora Ilo from Abuja, Nigeria. Today, the big issue we shall be looking at is the raging controversy on the raged marriages in Nigeria. In the last week or so, the Senate voted on this issue, and we've uh, heard, I mean, heard from uh, a lot of very distinguished legislators telling us they voted in error. That must be a big, big error. I have with me today in the studio experts that will be talking about the implications of this controversy. We are also looking at the lingering crisis in the education sector with our federal universities being under lock and key as a result of the ASU strike. I'll be talking with the ASU president and a team of ASU in a moment. Also in the course of our program, we'll be going to Enugu to get the latest reaction on which zone will present the next governor of Enugu State when the incumbent Sullivan Chime serves out his second term in the next 22 months. But first, let's go to our mail and look at a few of the many reactions to our program last Sunday, which featured former Governor of Anambra State, Dr. Chris Ngige. to the hundreds of you that got in touch with us in the course of the passing week, I say thank you. I must confess that, not, that we have not got so many feedbacks in recent past like we got in the last two weeks from the uh, Ngige interview. Please keep writing. That's the reason why we're here every Sunday. And in case you missed last week's edition or any other edition of Frontline, go to Frontline on AIT uh, to 10713 on YouTube or you go to our website www.frontlineng.com. But you know you can also join the conversation on Facebook, you can join it on Twitter, you can join it by text message, you can join it by email, and you can join it by calling us on the phone. In the course of the program, you see our addresses on these various social uh, media. Well, joining me in the studio now is a team from ASU. I have Dr. Nasir F. Issa. Uh, uh, Nasir Issa is president of ASU. Nasir, you're welcome to our program. Well, you're, um, happy to be with you. Yes, I have uh, Professor Biodun Ogunyemi, vice president of ASU. Thank you very Biodun, much. welcome. Thank you. And the past president of ASU, uh, Dr. Abdullahi Sulekano. Thank you. Gentlemen, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, where are we? At, at the school's opening on Monday? Well, I, I wouldn't say that because we, we had a meeting uh, with the government team on Friday at uh, 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, I like to believe that that is an exploratory meeting. Uh, we have been able to look at the outstanding issues in the agreement and we have uh, assigned responsibilities and we are hoping that on Monday and also on Thursday next week, we are going to get feedback from, from the government. people that have been assigned responsibilities. What were the issues that you put on the table? The issues are nothing other than the implementation of the 2009 ASU-FGN agreement. 
And um, we this time around said, let us look at the memorandum of understanding we had with government in January 2012. Uh, the key issues in that memorandum of understanding uh, include the funding issue in which government promised to make available the sum of 100 billion naira in 2012 and then sums of 400 billion naira annually for three subsequent years. We looked at that and we said, well, the best thing to do is to address the implementation of the needs assessment report. Uh, I'm sure you are aware that uh, a committee has been inaugurated uh, to implement the needs assessment report under the leadership of uh, His Excellency, the Governor of Benue State. Now, that committee has been assigned the responsibility of addressing the funding issue. And uh, we will wait and see what comes out of the Thursday meeting of that committee. Now, on the issue of uh, uh, federal government assistance to state universities, uh, the understanding is that the implementation monitoring committee of the 2009 agreement will work with the Ministry of Education to look at that issue. So we are also going to await you know, the outcome of the activities of the Implementation Monitoring Committee. There is also the 26% budgetary allocation to education. That had been you know, uh, forwarded to the Ministry of Education to pursue so that we will now begin to see change in implementation of that in the 2014 budget. Now there is the issue of the earned academic allowances. The government team is going to have to go back and confer with their principal and we will also go back and confer with our principal on that there are the other issues uh, transfer of landed property to universities and then the setting up of research and development units in the universities by companies operating in nigeria and then the issue of the formation of uh, nupemco and uh, the issue of formation of budget monitoring committee in the universities these have all been you know, forwarded to the Implementation Monitoring Committee of the 2009 Agreement to look into. Okay, Dr. Issa, um, let me talk to a former president of your uh, union. Please. Because I've talked with you before, and we hear you talk every day, I hear members of ASU, mm. and it's a little historical that, look, we enter into agreements with government, government don't uh, keep to these agreements. You were president before now. Yes. Has more changed? from the agitations of the days when you were president to the agitation today? Have we made any progress? Fundamentally, there is nothing that has changed, principally in the direction of government policy towards funding education. And what is amazing to scholars in Nigeria, and in fact academics all over the world, the way Nigeria handles education, is that you have a government in a developing country that is faced with myriads of problems that everybody knows that education is the key to the solution of these fundamental problems. But the government does not pay much attention to education, but to other sectors. Let me give you an example. If government will have the courage to bail out banks with a tune of three, three trillion naira, private businesses, that their impact on the economy, we haven't seen up to now. Because Nigerian economy is still not production. It is, it is not producing anything significant. Why can't they invest one third of that in education and take out this country from this general crisis? You see, we always tell government that universities are not burdened to this country. They have the potentials to provide more resources than what the government is generating from the crude oil. So are we actually, let me ask uh, Professor Gunyami, are we actually looking at uh, self-sustaining universities? Is it possible from, from what... Uh, 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 Dr. Sulekano is saying? Uh, well, we have a long way to get there. You see, before you can talk of self-sustaining, we must first build the universities. We must enhance the capacity of those working there. And uh, we must have laboratories that can lead to uh, research that supports development. We must have universities where we can attract the best brains. We can retain those we have in Nigeria. We must have a university environment where uh, we, 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 we can showcase which we can showcase across the world so that we can stand among the best across the world. So we, have not, we are not talking about uh, self-sustainable first. We must talk about building universities, enhancing capacities, providing facilities that can lead to development. 
the development of a university environment will give in to the development of the society. So until government comes up with a paradigm that can key the university into development framework for the country. So we are not yet there. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll take some time off and um, we'll be going to We'll be going to Enugu where we have uh, Obunna, Alex Obunna from Enugu. Alex, you're welcome to Frontline. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Alex, um, two weeks ago we had a traditional ruler from the Nsuka zone of Enugu state talking about the next governor coming from Nsuka zone. And you lead a group that calls itself the Greater Ogu Association or, or something like that. And you're saying that the next governor should come from the part of Enugu state that is Greater Ogu. Yes. Why are you insisting on this? Well, the, the fact is very clear. In 1992, we had Ogu Division, Usuka Division, and Rudy Division. It could be like that until 1959, we had Usuka Division, the division and Ogu division. These were the three divisions then that constitute what we call the local state today. So we are saying, and it continued like, until political gerrymandering came in, so that some local governments, so what use of this division had more local government than others. We are saying that the Soka division had, had a shot in the Ogushi the world. Who the division had a shot in uh, the history of the Chile. In fact, what came later to become a common cultural area had a slot in Timoru Kingdom Man. Of all those divisions we have now, we have now cited, only a good division has not tested governorship. And we are saying, as of right, that if you are looking, when you are discussing zone in the United States, you must put the four cultural zones into consideration Great Ogu, Abaja, Nkano, and the Soka cultural zones. There are four major cultural zones. And when you're discussing zoning, these four cultural areas are going to put into consideration. Yeah, Alex, Alex, Al Alex, just, just hold on. Um, a lot of people say that you guys are embarking on taking uh, back the hands of the clock. That in Enugu State, we have three senatorial zones, Enugu East, Enugu North, and uh, Enugu West. And you're suddenly coming with divisions that, uh, that, 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 that we stopped dealing with so many years ago. Uh, what, what are your what, what 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 is your position on this? Well, it is that is their own opinion about it. But if you look deeply into it, well, you cannot in, in in any way deny this fact which I have now enumerated above about the old divisions we had. That we had this military zone is just a political division, but it does not in any way discount the cultural entity which is great or cultural entity which is Nzoka or cultural entity which is Kano. So we are not saying we don't have senatorial zone, not like in Nigeria today. We have uh, regions, but there's nothing wrong with at least ethnic group in Nigeria. We are saying that we are a cultural zone that are not had a, a shot at governorship. That's what we are saying. Secondly, this was running. I'm a founder of, I'm one of the founders of BBP. In 1999, ever since then, people had freely contested governorship. The, the governor Solomon Chime, who is now the governor, okay, to put it contesting with him. And so the, today, okay, is here, he has a case in court against this Solomon Chime. So where, come, where, where is the justification for the zoning formula which we are trying to create now? Alex. So it has not been in, in existence before, and we are saying that if it should exist, we are saying if it should exist. Therefore, let's bring greater awareness into participation in the discussion for such a Okay, okay, Alex. A number of you are members of the PDP in Enugu State, and yes. the leader of the party in Enugu State, who is also the governor of Enugu State, Sullivan Chime, says yes. that the next governor should come from Nsoka. Is this not a kind of um, opposition to, to the leader of the party in Enugu State when, when Ogu suddenly says it has to come to Great Ogu? Governor, uh, Governor Chumari Naman, right, uh, had interest as a leader of the party in Sullivan Chimney. His former deputy, Kitchukwe Tai, contested. So, in fact, 
party, uh, party politics is like people are free to express their express their ambition, to express their aspiration. It's not opposition in any way. At the end of the day, whoever becomes the candidate of the party, we shall embrace and give support to the to the candidate. That somebody is not like it's not a dictatorship where you say it has to go this way. Tell me in Nigeria, even when uh, we say it's zoned here, for example, people are still free to contest. Okay, so, okay. We are not proposed to anybody contest it from anywhere. Okay. Let me ask you finally, we hear that you have been expelled from the PDP for your position. Is that true? I, I, I call it a rumor, and uh, I, if that is true, if that were to be true, of course it's the greatest joke of the year. Because I don't see anybody in PDP being expelled for expressing his opinion, expressing his aspiration, or trying to establish his legitimate interest in the party. If it ever happens, the only one in history. Okay, okay, Alex, Alex, uh, Alex, we'll leave it there. Um, I hope we'll have more opportunity to talk about this in the coming weeks. Um, thanks for your time. And, and returning to the studio, I still have the ASU team. Um, well, it's been a busy week. I, I know, uh, Mr. President, that speaking with you on the phone was quite a challenge over the week, meetings and meetings. Are we making any headway? Is there a kind of is, is there a kind of agreement? Even if we don't have an, I mean, uh, is there a kind of understanding? If we, even if we don't have an agreement yet. Well, the 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 key thing here is that um, I keep saying we had an agreement in two thousand and nine. What we are doing now is exploring ways of ensuring that we implement that agreement. And um, our members nationwide have expressed their feeling on the matter that what we need to do is to implement the agreement and then commence renegotiation exercise of that agreement. So, you see, whatever we are doing now, we will await you know, the outcome of the dialogue that is going on, which will now be fair to our members, and our members will now be in a position to say, okay, uh, with what has happened, we are in a position to review our earlier stance. Let me ask uh, your Vice President, yes, Professor yes. Ogunyemi. I mean, you've been at these negotiations. Yeah. Is there an atmosphere that is optimistic mm. in those... In those sorry, sorry, you called it negotiation, please. Uh, I think my President used the right word that we are talking. <laughs> but, okay. uh, but, but the dialogue... To us in Nasu, <laughs> to us in Nasu yes. we have gone beyond the stage of talking. We are now calling for action. Action on the roadmaps, if we can call them so. You see, the agreement was negotiated for three years. Thereafter, there was an MOU. That MOU was to spell out, you know, with timelines, how we go about implementing the agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, it is at the stage of action that we have problem somewhere along the line. So we are saying that, well, we are not opposed to dialogue on implementing the agreement following the roadmap. But we now have the latest document for which a committee has been inaugurated. That is NIS assessment report. So as long as we continue to, 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 to be guided by available documents, by available frameworks, we don't have problem with that. With the elder, elder statesmen like you, are we going to see some compromises, assuming government does not... Uh, agree 100 percent to whatever ASU is demanding with with the with the sense of hindsight you've been there before would you advise for some compromises for the younger ones like dr nasir <laughs> well to, <that's laughs> you know, to let the students <laughs> go back to school you, you see as scholars you know uh, we rely on reasoned argument we rely on superior positions of intellectual arguments and we rely on trust and confidence of people we are dealing with. So long as government, you know, will be sincere, you know, scholars are very reasonable people. You know, we bear the burden of these students more than any other person in society as people are assuming. Uh, it depends us. For example, uh, it, it, people may not mind, you know, uh, a child to uh, graduate within, a student graduate within four years and is reading hydrology. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a scholar teaching hydrology, you find that there is no water. He's going to be a water source engineer. 
That's a fraud. And he never dealt with he, water. He, he never dealt with water in his lab. Okay. So okay. these are the kind of things. What kind of compromise do you see you give under that circumstance? Okay. Okay. He, okay. He, um, he, uh, Dr. Abdullahi, um, thank you. But let me take, let me, let me ask the last question and mm. I'll be asking uh, uh, Dr. Nasir. In one sentence, mm. do you think the people you're dealing with are sincere? I await the outcome of Monday and Thursday meetings. Before you determine that, I must thank you for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs> I must thank you. Thank you very much. And thank I must you thank you, Prof, for coming. Thank you. And when we return, we'll be talking about this big controversy about 13-year-old girls getting married. Don't go away. I feel bad. bad about the marriage. Of course, I heard it during the news that the Senate, they sit over it to give a girl of 13 years uh, to allow her to get marriage. But I feel bad. A girl of 13 years didn't know anything. She don't even know. She will be playing of a, playing of a childhood play. She don't even know anything concerning marriage. So I feel bad in it, in giving a girl of underage out of marriage. I didn't even like it and I didn't support it. I think that it's a very wrong thing to do because to, we're, we're little. We're not supposed to be getting married by now because I wouldn't say my mom would give me up by now. It is totally wrong. I call it child abuse because the, as in, even, if you, even, if, even if she's in the matrimonial home, because she has not well learned, as in she has not well learned, she might not know what to do at, at, as in at a point of time. So to me, let me just say, in fact, let me just say it, it's, it's unfair. Law and a very bad decision that the Nigerian lawmakers are about to make if they have not made it yet. Because even presently, like those so-called matured people, like from, you know, 25 and above, that into marriage, you see crisis in marriage, let enough, a child of 13 years old, you know, it's very bad. She doesn't even know her left from her right. No, she doesn't, she has no much experience about what marriage is all about because marriage itself is an institution of, on its own. It's a life commitment. There are so many crises in marriage. No, it's not something that a child of 13 years old, I don't think a child of 13 years old, you know, can handle it. Needs to get matured both in mind and in body because at the age of 13, bearing child, I don't think the body is matured enough to be able to carry a child and then 
the liver. So it's a very bad thing. Well, those were Nigerians on the street talking about uh, marriage of uh, underage girls. And uh, joining me in the studio, I have a lawyer, a member of Youth Alliance on Constitution Review, Cynthia Mbamalo. Cynthia, you're welcome. Thank you. I also have in the studio... Um, Ezemwa Mwagu. Ezemwa Mwagu is a convener of the Say No campaign. Okay, let me start with you, Cynthia. Let's look at the legal implications. Is it legal for underage girls to get married? No, of course, it's not legal. Because, number one, of course, we want to go with the Child's Rights Act. By sections 21, 22, 23 of the Child's Rights Act, underage married and even betrothal of young girls is prohibited by that Child's Rights Act. And it places the age of marriage from 18. It says any child below the ages of 18 should not be given up for marriage, should not be married, especially for young girls, because they are the easily, they are the ones that face the danger more. And even if by, by the marriage, our marriage act in Nigeria, actually, is actually 21 years old that is placed at marriage. That if you're even below 21 years, you can't get married unless you have a consent of your parents. That is the marriage act. But for the, for our Child's Rights Act, it places the age at 18. Once you're below 18 years old, you cannot get married. You cannot be. It's, it's a crime. And it's even punishable with, with a fine of 500,000 and imprisonment, five years imprisonment, according to the Child's Rights Act. But, but now that the, now that the um, National Assembly is voting in favor, won't it change the law? Uh, no, I, I don't think the National Assembly is changing the law. I, I think the National Assembly... Um, purported to do something wholesome really but was implicated by the insensibility of one of their own who mobilized against the deletion of uh, uh, dr dr ejikoji please hold on uh, dr ejikoji is joining us from uyo in akwaibom state uh, yeah but let me just hold on dr ejikoji uh, as and where you were yeah so the point that i was making is that the national assembly was implica implicated by the insensibility of one of their own who mobilized against the deletion of uh, section 29.4b which ordinarily the senate wanted to you know delete so that it can then include by implication the 18 years and the the chap used religious sentiments to sway a, a number of his colleagues and that had unleashed the full that that you have seen in the society so in real terms they're going to have to revisit it because the advocacy around those issues are stronger and so it, it's not you can't say the senate is already doing that okay um you know we don't have too much time so i want us to go to specifics and that's why i'm going to dr gk og of ipas who is uh, in uyo uh, and i want to ask you specifically dr ag koji what are the health implications you're a medical doctor what are the health implications for a 13-year-old child to get married? Yeah, thank you, Obiora. The health implications are varied. Let me, let me start by um, saying things that the general public know about already. I'm sure you do know what is called VVF. VVF, VVF is bicycle vaginal fistula. This is a condition that um, occurs. Are you there? I'm with you, Dr. Ejik. Yeah, this is a condition that occurs when the head of the baby is bigger than the birth canal. So as the baby is pushing through the birth canal, there's a delay, and the head will now be stuck between the pubic symphysis, that is the pubic bone, and then the, uh, the other um, part of the vagina. And then in between the head of the baby and that bone is the urethra, which is the tube that connects the bladder, urinary bladder to the outside. So after some hours of being stuck there, that place that is caused by what we call ischemic necrosis, and then that place sloughs off. So when urine comes out of the bladder, or comes into the bladder from the kidneys, it will not be a receptor for waiting for the time the child will void. That urine immediately flows into the vagina, and it causes what we call vaginal fistula, and then the girl will be leaking of urine. Now, but this is actually the girls that survive, 
most of the girls die from obstructed labor. What will happen is that, you know, the uterus is a very interesting organ. Once it starts contracting, it will continue to contract until it expels what is inside it or us. So when it's unable to push the baby out, the uterus will now rupture. And the baby will die, including the mother. So it's a very, very serious problem. And um, the, the health implications is terrible. In fact, if you look at the, the people who die in terms of, of age, um, about six years ago, the Backup Foundation did a study to disaggregate and know what age group is dying most. And it was found out that 70% of all our maternal deaths in Nigeria is actually below the age of 18. So in other words, if we can allow those girls not to be pregnant until they are beyond the age of 18, which is when the, the, the birth canal will be fully mature, we can eliminate almost 50% of our maternal deaths very easily. And then if you look at what's going on in the, in the world now, yes, Nigeria has made a lot of progress in reducing maternal mortality due to mid this scheme. But what has also happened is that other countries are doing better than us. We were contributing 10% of maternal deaths to the world before, but now we are contributing 15%. Even though in, in real-term numbers we have reduced the number of women dying, but in terms of benchmarking with other countries, we are not doing enough. And one of those areas that we're not doing enough is making our young ones pregnant, and they are dying in the process. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Eji Kojamos, thank you for your health insights on this uh, discussion. And uh, uh, we hope that uh, you have a safe journey back to Abuja in a few days' time. Thank you, Abuja. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. So let's let's go back to um, Cynthia. Yeah, Cynthia, you said it's illegal, actually, yes. Yes. for uh, underaged girls. You said 21. If you have to do it below 21. Yeah, the marriage at but the child's right at places it at 18. At 18. Yes. What are the jail terms? Are there what are the repercussions if 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 if, if you indulge? <laughs> 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 there are repercussions. There's a fine attached to it. I want to even read it out from the the particular child rights act that provides for it because it states here that whoever married commits an offence and is liable to a, a conviction to a fine of five hundred thousand or an imprisonment of a term of five years or both or both as fine and imprisonment. So the child already criminalizes the act itself. And any other thing that, like you know, is the child right, wants you, it's already an offense that should be punished. But we've noticed so far that the act, though it's been passed by the National Assembly, you notice most states are still lacking behind in passing it in the states. So most times you want to use this as a law. People always tell you, okay, we've not passed it in our state, so you cannot come here and start claiming that this is an arrangement. And, you know, we have most of these issues in the northern part of the country. So when you go to those kind of areas, you want to rely on the Child's Rights Act. It's, it's hard for you to, to, con to take someone to court based on that. And then we don't have this issue with the Constitution, because each time they want to define full age, they always make, there's always a reference to section 29 4b that was why there was lots of advocacy for that particular section to be deleted because why that particular section talks about renunciation of citizenship but while it's there you know when something does not outrightly deny deny or derogate something it's in by implication confirms it and if it remains there it just clearly states that any woman who is married is deemed to be of full age so whenever i want to define who is what is full age to you i'll always tell you if she's married she is of full age that's okay. why we want let that section be up of be, be it. Up. Yes. Okay. Um, we'll take a break because we're having so many calls uh, from uh, those that are watching the program. And we did advise that we can only te t uh, take text messages. You can join the conversation by email. So we, we'll show you, we'll take a break to show you all the available uh, ways you can be part of, of this discussion today. And when we return, we'll talk more about... Um, this controversy and Bose Irunsi, the executive director of Women's Rights and Health Project, will be joining us from Lagos also in a moment. Don't go away.
Well, you know, before we take a, we took our break, we were looking at the sanctions if someone goes against the constitutional provision. But now we are looking at, you know, looking at the constitution again. How should we go to ensure that the younger members of of our society are taken care of? Well, the the, f the first thing is that. Uh, we have responsibility to protect our young people through the law. And the bigger implication for this also has something to do with um, underage voting, uh, which is also prevalent in certain sections of the country. Uh, what that means is that if, you're, if you can't vote in Nigeria until you are 18 years, and if you continue to uphold the fact that you are full age, you are full age by virtue of your being married, then you also, you know, Detract, distract from that that particular. Um, so it is important that as we, we remove ambiguities, all the ambiguities that has to do with, you know, this whether you are full age, whether it's citizenship, those ambiguities has to be removed by the deletion of that section 2940. Once that is done, it's clear that if you then infringe on these laws, whether you live in the north or in the south, you can be moved against through the constitution. But if these ambiguities continue to exist, and then the Child Right Act remains the way it is, not being domesticated by many of the states, then we will be in, in crisis. Many, the bigger issue for Nigeria is people getting away with petty crimes. Uh, and and, and um, part of that is the inability of institutions of state to rein in offenders and sanction people. And that is why you can find people boldly, even those who have done so in the, in the past, coming out clearly to say, look, there is nothing essentially wrong about it. It's, uh, it's about our religion. And people have come to say, hey, stop it. It's not about your religion. It's about your own proclivity for, 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 uh, how did you say it now? For young people. For <laughs> <laughs> so the, we, we've got to use the law to protect our young people. While we do all of this with Section 29 b it's difficult for us to also now reduce the age for contesting elections. A lot of young people are also being, uh, by law, you know, put out of even aspiring for, for elective offices. For you to be president of Nigeria, you have to be 40 years. And so even if I'm 39 and a half, by law, I cannot aspire to be. And that's, okay. that's something. Okay, let's go back to, uh, I mean, we can't, we can't divorce uh, whatever situation from the culture of Nigerians. We're a country of multiple cultures. And in some cultural backgrounds, it allows for people to get betrothed to young people. Yeah, we grew up as, 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 as an Igbo person, for instance. I knew that the, we have had stories of our, some of our parents who were betrothed at very young age. But they, they were sent to missionary schools. There was something called, uh, in, in the church circle, mm -hmm. where they are sent to go and grow and mature. And they don't live with their husbands. No, they don't live time. with their husbands. They've never had to live with their husbands. So this whole cultural thing is 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 to give the impression that our culture supports the degradation of young women, and that is not true. At any point in time, before you start having children, you will have at least matured. And even if that was what was happening in the age of dot com, in the dot com age, where people are going to the moon. We cannot continue to put out our own young women and say, hey, go get married. When other women are thinking of how to fly supersonic jets, drive, you, no, 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 no. We, even if that is what our culture, you know, used to be, when that happens, we've got to move and join the rest of the world. We are not children of the dark. Yeah. Um, um, Cynthia, do you, do you agree with him? Oh, Can there be a, a coming together of our culture? And uh, the supersonic age. Well, I remember my little Jesse one oh one in university. They say culture is dynamic. What does it keeps changing? Yeah, it moves with the people as the as the world grows and develops. So also does our culture. If not, I mean, once upon a time, it was a culture to kill twins, and now we have twins. We have triplets. We have quadruplets. I have four of them. I have two twins. Two so, twins. So what you keep saying, saying is our culture <laughs> is our culture. You said okay because it's a culture, but you. you let us, let us do away with the harmful cultures, the harmful practices, and let us readjust so that it moves and grows with the people. Now, we've seen that the, the fact that underage marriage has several health uh, hazards attached to it, and it also slows down development. Now, we're trying to compete with the world. Now, the world will not wait for Nigeria. 
the world we have to grow and how do we grow if there's no education how do we get sustainable development if we can't have quality human capital now if we have a larger chunk of our population being subjected to underweight marriages most times when those these young girls are married out they are deprived of education because before they know they start giving birth to kids so they are, they are forced to raise a family at a very tender age now what knowledge do they have to impact to the kids they are raising so they have little capacity to even act as capable mothers not talk of raising their kids in the right way now we have this kind of people secluded to not just illiteracy but also they are subjected to poverty because if you look at those families if you look at cases of underage marriage you notice that most of them most times they are living in abject poverty because if you carry out a survey most of these young ladies are left to fend for their children okay let me give you the last word uh, uh, um what will be the best approach now you know we have lawmakers who think that uh, we should allow underage marriages. We also have lawmakers who think we, we shouldn't. Then we have a lot of Nigerians that are saying that, no, this cannot happen. Then we have some Nigerians that are saying this cannot happen. So how do we move forward as one country and still achieve uh, these uh, objectives? Well, the, the thing is to overwhelm good with evil. I mean, uh, evil with good. More and more people will have to raise their voices by sending letters to their senators, to their House of Rep members. More and more state as House of Assemblies will have to be occupied. We will have to engage this constitutional review process as if it's the last thing that we need to do. And it's the governing thing, really. Because if we continue to treat the Constitution with levity, it's prefaced. The preface of the Constitution is we the people. Okay. And, and I think we are the people. Okay. And so except we come to terms with the fact that we are the people, then some other people will put their wishes and aspirations on us, and then all we will do will be to agitate. Okay, I'd like to thank you. Cynthia Mba Malo, lawyer, member Youth Alliance on Constitution Review. Thanks for coming to our program. Thank you. And um, SM Wago, who is also convener, Say No Campaign. Thanks for coming on our program. Thank you very much. Uh, like we have said, you can join the conversation on Facebook, by email, Twitter, text message. You are the reason why we're out here every Sunday. And for your time and for watching, I say thank you. I am Obiora Ilo from Abuja in Nigeria.